Hi, and welcome to More Than a Refresh, a podcast about data and the people who wrangle it. I'm Amanda Nystrom, the Chief Operating Officer at Command Prompt, a leader in open source excellence since 1997. We hope that you enjoy the podcast today and contact us for your Postgres and full stack needs, including 24-7 support. Find us at 503-667-4564 at commandprompt.com or at sales at commandprompt.com. Enjoy. More Than a Refresh is brought to you by Green Plum Database. Green Plum is a PostgreSQL-based, open-source, massively parallel database for analytics, machine learning, and AI. A VMware technology, Green Plum is a modern database that isn't limited by your data size or vertical scaling limitations. For more information or to get in touch, visit greenplum.org. Welcome to More Than a Refresh, a podcast about data and the people who wrangle it. Our guest today is John Callis. John, introduce yourself. Hi, I'm John Callis. I'm Director of Public Interest Technology at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, I have been a person working in computer security, cryptography, collaboration software, and online communities for a long time. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of PGP. I was also one of the co-founders of Silent Circle and Black Phone, which was a company that did secure voice video um, and telephone connections for working around the world. And we also made Black Phone, which was a security enhanced Android phone. Oh. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, when I read that in the notes, I almost had a little bit of fanboy moment. Um, the The importance of those technologies, um, I think, can't be understated. Let's talk about PGP for a moment because there's a, an interesting backstory to that that I think, you know, frankly, a lot of people don't know. I mean, if you're a Debian developer, sure. Um, but the wider open source world now, which is largely dominated by uh, people who rightfully use the technology, but don't understand the history thereof and why it's so important. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but as I recall, uh, once upon a time in another life, uh, the government hated encryption, still does, uh, but hated encryption, especially for the public because they were afraid that bad actors could do bad things. And as we all know, it doesn't matter you know, what law the government implements, bad actors are still going to do bad things. But one of the things that we were afraid of is that certain technologies would be able to be uh, absconded by bad actors who were not in the United States. And as I recall, the way the law was written it was not written in a way that said that the source code for encryption, um, how can I put this? It, it couldn't be emailed or FTP'd or downloaded or digitally transmitted, but it could be put into a book to be transcribed. Is that correct? That's partially correct. Okay. Um, um, it's, it's really important to remember that encryption and code breaking were extraordinarily important to the 20th century and geopolitics. It's probably something we think of more now with a war going on in Ukraine, but the code making and code breaking things in World War II probably shortened the war by two years and thus probably saved, oh, I don't know, 10 million, 50 million people's lives. Sure. So, so to, you know, you're right, but they weren't completely wrong. This was one of the most valuable technologies that anybody had. And as computers took over, um, people started thinking about what would be going on on, on it. And, for example, Whit Diffie and Marty Hellman, whom you probably know from Diffie yeah. Hellman, right. saw the very early internet and each of them said that we would not be able to conduct our lives on a network when they saw that this was the way the world was going without strong encryption. And this led to something of a crisis in the late 80s and early 90s where 
the internet was coming, everybody could see the train coming down the tracks, everybody knew that having it be completely open and anyone could do anything to it was not going to be good for its possibilities. You know, it's like, how could you have a conversation like ours? How could you safely buy things? So on and so forth. And yet there's this tension here. And encryption until 97 was regulated the same way that a munition is regulated. And there are regulations that is, in, in the U.S., it's ITAR, which is International Trafficking in Arms Regulations. ITAR always said in it, and I memorized this, printed material, including source code, is exempt from these regulations. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah. And, and, and this comes out of things like the Cold War, where, where we, as a society wanted to do things like regulate technologies that were decisive in the previous world war and at the same time didn't want to be these sort of people that we criticized and would do things like banning books. So they put this carve out in there that was weird. And when you get into things like books containing source code, it starts to also get a little bit weird. And um, Phil was investigated. This is Phil Zimmerman, who wrote the original PGP. Phil was investigated for breaking the regulations about export control and never charged. One of the things is that there's the myth that, oh, he was charged with a crime. He was tried or anything like this. It's like he was only ever investigated, but you shouldn't underestimate the the stark terror that it should put in the pit of your stomach if the government is investigating you and that this is really a very serious thing. So um, one of the things that we all did in those days was there were people who, who were looking at what we were going to be doing and the, one of the landmark cases was tried the lawyer for it was our executive director at EFF, Cindy Cohn. And this is the Bernstein case where the discussion was all around how much of the source code can I publish it and why is paper so magical? Because, you know, think about it this way. The regulations say, as you said, you can't FTP it, you can't put it on a website, but if you magically put it onto a book, you can export mm -hmm. it. And this is peculiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the things I, I want to point out that you said, and, and I think this is important, um, you, when you talked about World War II, the, the, the tension and the balance in that the government wasn't all wrong, right? Um, and it, one, it's nice to hear someone who is a privacy advocate recognize that. Okay, let me say that. Um, from a personal perspective, uh, it's none of the government's business what I do as long as I'm not hurting anybody else. Yep. And that I think that's the real problem is is the government, as we've seen through, you know, especially over, let's say, the last, I guess now it'd be, you know, 30, 40 years, we've gone through quite a bit of evolution. I mean, just talking about something simple, you know, it... I remember, and I'm sure you do too, it wasn't that long ago that a president signed the Defense of Marriage Act. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, and, and it wasn't that long ago. We were both adults at the time, um, if younger. <laughs> uh, and now we have legalized marriage for gay people, right? Um, and the problem comes in is that, you know, the fact that either of those happened in my mind is wrong, right? The fact that both of those happened is wrong because it's none of their business. Okay. Right? It's just, it's not. It's, the only thing the government, especially if we're talking about that particular thing, the only government thing the government should be responsible for is the canonical archiving of the contract between two people. It doesn't matter what the people, you know, whether yes. they're male, female, gay, I, not, whatever. I think, I think 
two people should be allowed to get married, period, end of sentence. Yeah, it, it's it, it's ridiculous. Um, but the point that I was actually making, without because I don't want to get sidetracked into that, um, is it, it, it is a difficult balance. And people, especially in government, who by default end up as authoritarians, balancing that, the will of society versus the good of society, the recognition of, you know, the fact that we're, it, 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 there's a lot of different viewpoints of what that means, right? Uh, that that it's good that we're not sitting here saying just that, you know, we should have, be able to have as citizens the ultimate encryption power, privacy power, which I would agree with, except that there's a whole other big world out there that's much larger than the United States citizenship uh, that a lot of them want what we have, want to take what we have, and we need to recognize those threats, whether or not we want to or not. I certainly don't okay. want to. I would certainly rather just sit on my deck. But, you know. Yep. I think you I think you hit upon a whole bunch of small points on there that tie together really well. And one of the ones that I'm going to hit is a peeve of mine, a particular when we, when we talk to them, is the word balance. Mm -hmm. And I despise the word balance. Because if you think about it, where you're invoking the metaphor of a scale where things go up and down, for one side to go up, the other side has to go down. It implies that that for somebody to win, somebody else has got to lose. And I don't, I don't agree with that. I believe that we can have both privacy and security. I think that, that one of the things that we need to do is to say let's describe a world with the rights and enforcement of them. Because that's what encryption does, is encryption enforces the rights through technology. It's not, in, in the old days when we had like copper wires for phone things, there were lots of rules about who got to touch those and when. And, and you know, you could be unsummarily fired from the phone company for listening in on other people's phone calls. Um, so they enforced it with policy, rules, and so on. And encryption is great because it enforces it with technology. And, but the real thing that we're talking about is the basic human right of two people ought to be able to talk together in private. And the thing that networking from the phones onto the internet created was a world where you know, I can be in California and you can be in, in the East Coast and we can be having a private conversation despite the fact that we're 2,500 miles away. And I ought to be able to talk to you in private. I ought to be able to whisper in your ear no matter where you are because human beings need connections with other human beings. It's a basic human right. We need that like we need air. And... The intelligence communities saw that this was, <clears throat> they saw that it was inevitable. And in, first in 97 and then in 2000, and gradually ever since, things got liberalized. So we have, we have free and open use of encryption from a regulatory standpoint for 20 to 25 years now. There are also other things that are going on. I mean, you know, the, the, the world has changed with other stuff. And law enforcement has this tendency to leap to surveillance as their mechanism that they're going to do to fight bad people, which we all know doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. And we all know has bad effects on society as a whole. Um, it's... It, it, it's just a part of the literature that it does horrible things for for a society when people are not who, when people think that they're that they're that there's always someone listening in. So this is a bad thing, and we don't want to go there. But law enforcement has a tendency to say, if only I could listen in, I would magically be able to fix this. And that's really the fight that we continue to have, and we're having right now. Um, we're having it here in the U.S., we're having it in Europe and other countries. And the danger for us in the U.S., because you think, oh, you know, that's happening other places, is that because we are so interconnected 
and because of what we have in terms of a true global communications infrastructure, what happens somewhere else could very well affect what goes on here. So we have to pay close attention to, to things that on a global scale do not matter. Yeah, and it's interesting, though, and, and though I agree with you, I, I want to address a point. You said that two people, and in your, in your example, it was across you know country, in our country, mm -hmm. uh, should be able to uh, speak privately to each other, right? Mm -hmm. With no fear of being surveilled or, or listened in on. And again, I agree with you, but is there a, a counter argument? I mean, consider that these are public networks, right? There's no, it, it, this, you do not have a direct connection to that individual. You are passing mm -hmm. through any number of um, privately owned and publicly owned networks. If you're using a VPN, you might be passing over into, say, Europe or you know Thailand or something. And suddenly you have a scenario where you're in the jurisdiction of multiple entities and you're expecting to have rights that aren't necessarily guaranteed in any of those entities. Right? I well, I, I think that the right to talk privately with another human being is is a universal human right. Period. End of sentence. I mean, we you know we do have conventions on universal human rights that 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 are expected to be everybody agrees that these are the basics, and and I think that human connection is one of those those basic rights, no matter where you are. See, that's an, and I, again, agree with you, but I, I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here. If you were sitting across from me at the table and we were sharing mm -hmm. a great bottle of pick your spirit, uh, I would agree that we are in my private domicile. This is my property. Uh, we can say whatever we want and we should not have fear that somebody is listening to the vibrations on the windows to see what we're talking about. Without, you know, a warrant, basically. Um, but across the nation, across the country, across the world, you're, you're not in a private space, right? Well, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean that you're, you don't own the network. You don't own no. the transmission lines. You don't own the routers, the switches, or any of that, right? Um, so you are crossing, I mean, if we're talking about the physicality of human connection, although it's bits and bytes or, or analog signals, depending on what you're hitting, uh, that's going across the nation to talk to this in other individual, you don't own or have right to any of that property, except so to the much. point that it reaches your wall. You don't even own your outlet, right? That's the, that's the utility company or the cable company for internet or whatever. So, so, but, but. If we were talking unencrypted, totally in the clear, there would be um, a bunch of ones and zeros that travel across those wires, air, glass, etc. And a human would be able to turn those into something intelligible. You know, whether it is, you know, whether it is text or it's going through a, an audio video codec sure. like we're doing, it, you know, it's ones and zeros. And what encryption is doing is taking those ones and zeros and turning them into other ones and zeros that only you can decode into something that is there. It, it doesn't matter that it's somebody else's network because the whole idea is that that network is transmitting our bits and if our bits cannot be read by anyone else then then they don't have they don't have a right to surveillance they don't have a right to that that we are protecting ourselves with this with this tool with this math and we're protecting ourselves so that nobody else can get meaning out of them there's no right that they ought to be able to get meaning out of it so we're talking about a how can we put, we're talking about a right, because you said a human right, which mm -hmm. which is a, uh, an interesting concept. Um, but we're talking about a right that supersedes these human-made laws, 
right? Or human-made regulations where because we exist, we breathe, we are humans, we have, we have a requirement for connection um, that we also in turn have a, a right to have that connection without fear of surveillance. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I, I can't really argue with that. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the EFF because I want to make sure that we, that as people listen and see that, I mean, we certainly can get, uh, go on and, and talk about privacy and we will. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the EFF backstory mission. Um, you know, I had spoken before we got on, we're recording. Uh, you have similar missions as, say, the ACLU or the newer one, which is the FIRE, which is all about freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're not a young nonprofit. You've been around for decades, since, uh, what, 30, 30 years. Um, and you, the EFF essentially, if I'm going to boil it down, fights for the rights of privacy and digital freedom within a world that is now nothing but digital. Yeah. Um, an, another way that, that, that I have gleefully stolen <laughs> from one of my colleagues is that our mission is that your rights ought to be the same even when you are using technology and networking and so on, that your rights do not change for this, which incidentally goes back to what we were saying just a moment ago, is that, is that my saying it shouldn't matter that, that, we are, that we are talking, that we have a right to it, and that we enforce it with the tools, is that the whole mission of the EFF is that your rights shouldn't change because you're using technology. You know, I, I, you saying that, it, it, it trips a trigger. Um, many moons ago, uh, I lived in a rural small town. Uh, in a rural small town, you go to church. No matter what you believe, and I don't care what you believe, but you go to church. That's what you do. It's one of the ways that you connect with community. It's one of the ways that you're not ostracized from that community. You go to church. Um, and I was in a, a Bible study and they were talking about the internet and this was a conservative, uh, small town, which most rural small towns are, uh, and a gentleman who I respect greatly, he, he posed a question and his question was, um, you know, as a Christian, should we consider fighting for restricting the internet? And the argument is that the internet provides, which is especially relevant recently, a lot of misinformation. There's a lot of badness that comes across. You obviously, you don't want your eight-year-old accidentally coming across, you know, pornography or whatever. Um, and it, it, it so offended my sensibilities <laughs> that I just blurted out. I'm like, should we also, you know, inhibit the use of hammers and wrenches? The internet is a tool. Right. That's all it is. It's just a tool. And it's how you use that tool that matters. And, you know, I basically and he said, but what about my kids? I said, be a parent. Right. It, 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 it's your responsibility. It's the Internet literally just flows information. It's no different than going to the library for all these people who are now up in arms trying to ban certain books from libraries. You ban books from your home because you want to raise your children or yourself in a certain way. The library should be the ultimate sanctuary for all information. You don't ban that information. You have to be a parent. Stop mm -hmm. being lazy, basically. Um, now, that being said, I would, as a parent, I want to say that it is exceedingly difficult to parent in now, now's time because of the massive amount of information, um, the massive amount of technology, even as a techno technology guy myself, you know, I'm about to be 50 and I find myself looking at some of the stuff that they use and just shaking my head, right? I'm not even going to try and figure this out. Um, mm -hmm. And there are certain social media companies that are preying on that opportunity, right? Um, anyway, so you do have, and I don't want to go off on that. And as a parent, I can do that all day long. Uh, so the, you've got three main teams at the EFF. We've got legal, we've got activism, and technical. Um, I think legal is yeah. obvious. You know, you're you're walking the halls. You're helping write legislation. You're trying to influence legislation. I'll, 
Yeah, and ultimately we are a law. You're, okay, so ultimately you have a lot of attorneys trying to protect our rights. Yeah. Um, are you an attorney? Yeah. No. No. I'm not. Uh, and then we have activism. I have a feeling that's where you fall in, as well as technical. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I lead. Okay, the you lead the tech group. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. And the activism people get people excited. Yeah, they're the advocates. Yep. And and those people often come from journalism or other related fields because their their goals are investigation, writing, convincing. Um, and, you know, for example, when we want to do things like um, affect legislation, they will be the people who do stuff like produce our campaigns, help us refine our message so that it becomes more convincing, and so on. Okay. Now, um, let, let's talk about the technical part of it. I mean, most of our listeners are going to be technical in some way or former technical. Um, now, you have like Privacy Badger. Which is a plugin. Yep. I know what it does, but tell us what it does. It's a plugin runs on Chrome and and all of those Chrome like browsers as well as Firefox. It removes trackers. Okay. You you install it. It basically has no UI. It just removes trackers. So so whatever those cookies and other things that we're doing with them, it identifies what they are. And it just removes them from your browsing so that the websites that you go to don't know that you also went somewhere else. Now, I've, I've had this conversation before on this podcast. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but put this into a standard every... Like my mom. My mom is an internet user, okay? Um, what mm -hmm. Privacy Badger does is it makes it so that when you go to Amazon and you search for, in my case, it would be backpacks, it would be uh, survival gear, things like that. I don't go to Facebook and then see those ads. Is yeah. Yep. Or it makes it so that Facebook doesn't know what you're doing on Amazon. Or to put it another way, with their, one of the recent scandals was that some... Um, health organization, a hospital or something like that, had some convenient Facebook little logo things on them. And that was ending up, Facebook was using those to get your medical information so that they'd know oh what was on the web page. And Privacy Badger disrupts. So if, if someone searched for uh diabetes, for example, then Facebook would know that you were searching for diabetes and make the assumption that at a minimum you wanted to know about the disease, but probably you or a loved one had it and then therefore would advertise you and advertise to you in a direct manner. Yeah. Yeah. And and in some respects it isn't it isn't so much the searching. It's that if you went to a diabetes information website and they had like, you know, a little Facebook logo icon or something on it, that's going to contain both the information that comes just from that icon, which is like, you know, timestamps, IP address, and so on. Uh, but it might include JavaScript that tells them other stuff. Yeah, and well. Privacy Badger prevents that. Yeah, okay. it removes that's, them. I think that we, that's said enough. I think everyone should install it. Um, okay, so... What is the the main foot? What what are we doing now with uh, the technical teams at VFF? What are we trying to produce? So, one of the things that we do in the technical team is that we support both of the other groups because we're capable of of reading specs, documents, et cetera, and being able to explain to the lawyers and the activists exactly what's going on on things so that, so that they're technically correct. We also go and um, talk to legislators and other people about things like right to repair issues, like, right, like um, protecting encryption, like net neutrality, broadband access, all of these things that we're the ones who understand at some level or another, um, at a high level or a deep level, how these things work. 
Andres spent some time working with one of my old colleagues from ACLU on an FAA thing that FAA is right now putting together um, the regulations for drone flying beyond visual mm-hmm. line of sight, or you know, they'd say BVLOS, that that that's beyond visual line of sight, and that includes a lot of really important stuff that's going on, like right now, pipelines, long distance power lines, so on and so forth. They have to be inspected, and they're inspected by people in helicopters or small planes who fly over the entire mm-hmm. distance of that pipeline, etc., all the time. Why do we why do we need to do this with human beings? Why can't we have some sort of drone do that? There are the people who are doing stuff that goes into more um controversial speculative stuff like you know can ups deliver a package right, or amazon in yeah. any of these things that that all of these are beyond visual line of sight and they're putting together the regulations on how those work they invited us aclu and epic to come in and and work on the regulations with them and we're concerned about a lot of things like this drone has camera footage. What happens mm-hmm. to the camera footage? Does Amazon get pictures of your backyard because they delivered you a package? Yeah. You, you know, that's, that's just one of many very thorny questions because, you know, it runs into things like why, yes, we all have rights to take photographs in mm-hmm. public places. But it's different when there are cameras everywhere. And it's okay to say that it's different because there's, there, 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 there's, there's, there's a scope of all of this stuff where something that is more or less okay can become totally not okay. And we want to have regulations in place about how they deal with this stuff. And this is incredibly important work that Andres has been doing because you just know that when they get these regulations done, which they want to do by the end of 2022, that this is going to be in place for somewhere between 20 and 75 right. years. It, it's, it, these aren't you know, short, you know, these are things that are an impact. I mean, right. it, for, and, and kudos to them for bringing us in. And this is the sort of thing that's extraordinarily important for us to be doing. So we, we work with FAA. We work with Congress. Um, I, you know, I, I have talked to state congresses and other people about right to repair and so on. So that's part of what we do in the tech group. We also have, have tech things that we do. And we used to call ourselves tech projects, like Privacy Badger, like CertBot, that that we retired our HTTPS everywhere thing because yeah. we won. You know, over over 95% of the used internet, not of the sites, but of the used internet, is all, is all encrypted mm-hmm. with TLS. So we don't need that anymore, and we retired to that. Um, it's been a 10-year-long effort that EFF led and lots of other people have done with the idea of why don't we just encrypt the internet, which again brings us back to things like the human rights of what do you do in private. And now the ISRG who do Let's Encrypt make it so that you can get TLS certificates for free. Um, CertBot is a piece of software. It's Python code, comes shipped on almost Mm -hmm. all Linux distributions. it will go out to to Let's Encrypt and it will update your certificates in the background so that you don't even have to think about it. That was an incredibly important thing. It was part of Let's Encrypt. One of the people who was in my group works full time on Let's Encrypt. It's EFF's way of helping out with Let's Encrypt so that we have a full time person working on it. So, so that's what the tech group does in addition to lots of explaining and so on. We put our foot down on things and thus we are also a software development organization and we have all of the problems of a software development organization that includes things like maintenance is forever yeah maintenance as someone who has developed software it never goes away someone who runs a company that develops software it never goes away um 
I'm going to ask a silly question because I, I mean, I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say, but I, I think it might be in the minds of our listeners. Why isn't there EFF the browser or EFF the operating system? The first answer would be EFF total is 100 right. people. My group is 15 people. We don't have the people to do that. We don't have the money to do it. Um, that that there, you know, there is the reality that people need to have jobs that pay their rent or mortgage, buy food, clothes for their mm -hmm. kids and so on. And, and how are you going to do that on, on a nonprofit basis? Pretty soon you start ending up looking like profit business when you do these sorts of things. It really is the what is it appropriate for a nonprofit to do as something else. So a lot of what we do is advocate for one way or another what we think the other organizations okay. ought to Fair do. Fair enough. Um, okay, so we've talked about encryption. Um, we've talked about EFF as a whole, which I think is, uh, again, it's very important that people recognize this. You mentioned Epic. That's uh, one I hadn't heard of. Can you just give me 10 seconds on that? Uh, they are a privacy organization out of Washington, D.C., also been around since, I think, the late 90s or so. They are explicitly focused on privacy, and and they are they are okay. D.C. oriented. Um, what do you think, you know, what are, what are the most important issues to the EFF? Like what, what are the threats to secure communication going on right now? Cause you, you did mention like the internet, it's encrypted. Um, you know, if you want to be able to privately message people, you can use signal, you can use telegram. You can, I mean, there's, there, there are applications out there that ensure, at least in theory, that your stuff can't be listened in on. The, the biggest threats that we have, and, and as I mentioned, the threats are not only in the U.S., sure. they are around the world. They're, they're coming from a lot of the things that you were talking about before. They, it's not only law enforcement who is really the biggest threat um, because they, they believe in error, in my opinion, that it is going to fix their problems if they can just surveil things. There are also a lot of people who just flat believe in a oh, surveillance sure. society. And you see, you know, you see this sort of thing where like, you know, Amazon ring cameras, where they're encouraging you to feed in footage from you and all of your neighbors directly into the, mm -hmm. the police office so that the cops can watch everything. Um, um, that's, that tendency towards surveillance is one of the issues. One of the issues that I think is a huge problem is the conundrum of free speech. Because here in the U.S. we have the most um, strong free speech expectations and laws and rights in the world where they're much stronger mm -hmm. than most people think they are. I mean, you know, you know, uh, you, you know, you see this thing. If, if, you, if you like to read certain areas of Twitter, you see these sorts of things like, you know, bad legal takes, bad First Amendment takes. Mm -hmm. Why is our protected speech? Hate speech is protected speech. Um, um, misinformation is protected speech. And this goes back to difficult philosophical questions like what is misinformation? That time and time again, we have had things where new ideas were considered to be misinformation before they were considered accepted. And yes, indeed, there are all sorts of things that we know are not true. But once you start making a government entity be the arbiters of the truth, that goes into a very dangerous area. And we're far more, 
we're far more adamant about free speech than most other places are. That go ahead. Be, because you know, free yes. speech does have costs. There really, you know, there are there there are lots of people saying all sorts of things out there that are just categorically false. Yeah, and it, as I understand it, and I am not a lawyer, um, it, it is not the government's responsibility or right to determine what speech is okay. Right. Okay. Governments exactly. don't have rights. We have rights. Rights rights are barriers against what and, the and that's can the, do. a perfect statement. Um, and you run into problems um, with a lot of people not understanding what the First Amendment is about because you'll have someone like, let's say, Twitter, uh, who does censor, hmm. um, but it's their it's their platform. Um, mm -hmm. Now right. the difficult there's a difficulty there though because. Things like Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, um, good God, TikTok of all things, they are becoming the public square through a private entity. Okay, maybe, maybe not for you and I, right? But um, well, well, when you say public square is a okay, let's explore that. That that is used by people who want to regulate speech and and because um if you look at it in terms of I mean, a, a standard thing that we say about public speech is that is restrictions upon the government you don't have to listen to things that people want to say the, you know the right to free speech does not imply the obligation to listen and and that's even also in the First Amendment because, you know, the First Amendment has five rights in it. There's, there's freedom of religion, there's freedom of the speech, and freedom of the press, which are very closely related to each other. And how the freedom of the press has changed in the last 30 years is very interesting because there used to be an aphorism that said, freedom of the press applies to those that own one. And... And in, in 1920, the people who owned a press is very different than it is in 2020, where you right. own a press. We're doing it right now. We're using your press right now. And so, and, you know, and really now, anybody who's got a blog is got mm. a press, essentially. There's so we got those three. We also have um, freedom of association, which also by extension includes the freedom to not associate with people. You know, you know, you cannot be you cannot be punished for hanging out with people that you want to hang out with by the government. You were in a small town. Everybody goes to church. The government isn't allowed to punish right. you for not going to church. Now, your grandma has every right to harangue you. <laughs> Why aren't you going to church? <laughs> but 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 you but you cannot be punished by the government for whatever you do. And 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 freedom of association is in fact one of the things that, that you know we'll talk about this. It's like you know freedom of association is like why right. you can block people on Twitter. I don't That's have right. to listen to you. <laughs> And, and the last one is the right to petition the government for the redress of grievances. So that is, you know, things like you get to write your, your, your Congress critter. Right. Congress right. critter. I like that. Um. <laughs> so, 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 you know, that's why the First Amendment is complex, because it includes five things that are both incredibly linked together in some cases and incredibly different and 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 the way that they interplay is i think part of why they're all lumped in especially as the first one but the real thing is that's a limit on the government it is not a limit on 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 the rest of us and this gets into follow on questions that include things like competition mm. it is it is a a problem, I think, that, you know, when we were both young, there were basically right. three television networks in the U.S. And now you basically have 
three things dominating mm -hmm. what goes on on the internet. You know, Facebook, Twitter, well, and Google. Yeah. And so the, the that that there is a sense in which we really did open things up because of what I said by like you know you are now covered as much by freedom of the press as you were by freedom of speech. But on the other hand, we just shuffled some of the cards and redealt the same cards out the same way. And, and the question of what do we want our society to be is always one of the most important ones. And it is one of the ones that is always changing because everything always changes. The concerns of 2020 are not the same concerns of 1990. The concerns that we'll have in 2030 will be slightly different. And one of the things that I recognize is the way things have changed. And this is culturally as well as anything else. A long time ago, for example, science fiction and comic books and other things were a subculture mm -hmm. and off to the side of what things were. Now they're the mainstream. The EFF used to be concerned with what was a side thing off on, on society. And now we're front and center in everything because of the way that software has eaten everything, the way that the internet has totally redone the way that, that things like printing presses that worked for hundreds of years. So our mission has changed because we are no longer a thing that is a detail of society. We have, we have been moved to the center of everything and it makes things more difficult. So yes, I would agree, uh, especially, you know, as you and I were younger, the things that we did were obscure to most, right? Um, I mean, to this day that people still dial up to AOL is surprising to me. Um, but in this, there are, are certain human conditions that seem to never, I don't want to say never, but rarely change. Um, you know, a, a friend of mine and uh, a very gracious individual, Mark Porter, he's the CTO of MongoDB. Uh, and he was once one of the, the lead guys over at AWS for their database services. And he gave a key, keynote at one of our conferences. And I, I'm not quoting him here because I don't remember the exact thing that he said, but it essentially boiled down to the convenience is the future. Um, and, and I think that there's is some tellingness to that. Um, and I think there's a real danger to that. I, I see it now in younger folks um, who like to gripe about not being able to good, get a good job, but they're not willing to be a plumber, which pays very good money. Um, and I... Well, okay. certainly, I don't, I, I don't either, but I would if I needed to in order to have a living. Right. To be able to provide yeah. for my family, to own a home, those types of things. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know if I know of anybody that wants to be a plumber. <laughs> I mean, um, but, uh, you know, and it's fine. Don't don't be a, you know, you don't have to want to do it, but you need to do what you need to do to be a productive member of society. Uh, and I think that was the, the statement I was trying to make. And this reliance mm -hmm. on convenience, it's all too easy to not be a productive member of society. And when you combine that with, to me, it appears that's the goal of many of the organizations. We don't want productive members of society. We want them glued to the screen and buying our widgets okay. and things like that. So... I, and I don't think that my point there is I don't think that's ever changed. I, I think it's continued to slowly evolve, but it's never actually changed. I I I, okay. I, I want to call Please. bullshit on a little bit of that because come on, come on, we were we were lazy yeah. when we were young. You know, you know, every generation has a movie that describes what their life as as teenagers and young adults were. And, you know, um, um, 
for for me and only a slightly lesser extent for you is a movie <laughs> called Dazed and Confused. You know, um, uh, so let's not you know let's not pretend that 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 we were we were little worker ants all doing this stuff. Um, um, so okay, but and you know, and I want to say things like so. What the heck does productive member of society mean, and why should okay. you be one? Now, now that's pretty. That you know? gets a little philosophical. I, I do want to mention one thing, though. Uh, I started my first company at twelve. Okay, so I I was mowing lawns, and from there I went to a slightly darker side where I was chopping stolen bikes. And then I came back and I ended up doing things like installing car stereos. I have always worked. Now, that was by nature of my circumstance. Uh, and certainly not everyone has my circumstances. And so I respect that. Um, but you're right. I, I think, you know, for me, the, the, the movie was not dazed and confused. It was um, Breakfast Club. Okay. So, yeah, I, okay. I get where you're coming from. Uh, and... You're right. I mean, maybe there's a little bit of bullshit there. Maybe there's a little bit. I'm getting old, and I'm looking a lot of bullshit. And I'm looking at the <laughs> younger generation, going, "Damn it! What the hell?" Um, but you know, I have teenagers, so <laughs> uh, maybe that's part of it. Um, okay, so um, as we move through this, uh, let, let's. You know, there's private company data collection. I mean, you mentioned law enforcement. I think we could do a whole episode on that because one of the problems with law enforcement is that it's law enforcement. It's not community betterment. Um, the reality is, yeah. go ahead. Which, which by the way, the thing that, you know, you know, one of those things that to try to defuse a lot of the really horrible terms that people use, when you talk about community betterment, that's exactly what some people very awkwardly say, mean when they say defund the police. You know, what they, what they really mean is we need to better our community with something that is more subtle than... Billy oh, and you're and, absolutely right. And, and, and the, the worst thing to come out of defund the police was the statement to fund the police, because that's not the problem. It won't solve anything. Yeah. It'll just create problems. What we have to do is change the phil ph philosophy behind what that what police are. Right. It shouldn't be. It, right. It, it shouldn't be the first thing that shows up to my door. If there's a noise complaint is a man in a bulletproof vest with a semi-automatic weapon. Right now, is that man maybe at the street backing up yeah. the community officer that's knocking on the door and just saying, hey, you know, we've gotten a complaint? Maybe that's the case. I don't know. But certainly we've got to get away from the idea of law enforcement, mainly because there's laws for everything. Some of, so many laws that people, even the Supreme Court recently mentioned this. There's so many laws it's impossible not to break them. Right? It, 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 yes. It, it's there, – there, there's – there's a really good book that is called How to Become a Federal Criminal, and it's run by the people who do the crime a day Twitter thing. And the average person, it is sure. estimated, I don't have any, I don't have facts on this. I'm just quoting a thing that the average person commits one felony a day. <laughs> And well, then I guess that I'm not legally allowed to own the guns I own. Um, <laughs> geez. It, it, it runs into the problem that selective right. enforcement and that's true. is the norm. I, th without going down that path, because we are getting long in time, and I really want to be able to address this with you. What do you think the biggest problem today is? What is the biggest threat today? I think that the biggest threat is... Is well, I don't think it's creepy. Authoritarian, <laughs> and it and it isn't even creeping and anymore. Give me no that it really it really is it really is a people who claim to be against the government are the first ones who want to have the government tell That's true. other people what <laughs> they're not do. against the government. They're against the government telling them what. They don't want to hear. Yeah. 
Yeah, they don't want to be left alone. They don't want to be left alone. They want to so, tell people what to do. Would that roll into something like states' rights? We, you know, obviously, we had that recent decision that has upset a lot of people. Well, for example, when with, with the rights, overturning of mean? Roe versus Wade and throwing it back to the states, we now have states. It's no longer a federal issue. It's back to the states. And so they have a right to so, determine how they're going well, to implement their you know, procreation policy. Mm -hmm. our, our, our country is different from most of them in that we are intentionally a collection right. of small countries. And this is my friends in Europe when they talk about things like, you know, they come here and they, and something happens, like they cross a state line and they can tell because the pave, you know, the asphalt slightly different, the, the, you know, the road signs are slightly different, you know, the, 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 the color and texture of the yellow lines on the road. And it's like, you know, it's like, how could you even do that? And, and I explain that our country is far more like the EU in that it is a collection of sub countries that, that have a, a substrate, well, actually superstrate of laws over it governing how they treat each other, but mostly they get to do what they want and mostly they all do the same thing because they'll tend to do something mm -hmm. if it works for somebody else, more or less. And that's how we get both uniformity and differences. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really great that California has different laws than, than, than Texas. Well, you certainly um, picked two uh, uh, divisive states there. Um, it, I agree. <laughs> well, I, th I think where I get hung up is I, I'm actually, uh, I lean more independent than uh, anything else. And one of the most frustrating things, for example, for me, is um, the Second Amendment applies differently in every state, um, which it can be a challenge. And it goes back to what you said about how uh, it's very, you know, you commit a felony a day. Well, I there's so many different rules about the fact that I have my concealed carry that, I mean, I have to be a legal analyst to make sure that I'm not violating the law when I go from Washington to say Maryland. Um, and I yeah. think, you know, it used to work well because most people didn't leave their state. A lot of people didn't leave their hometown, but now, I mean, like I did 30 States last fall. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, 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 I'll say that it's, it's, it's more than, you, it's more than you think, but, but sure. And, and one, what has happened in the U S over the last approximately a century or so is that we started to decide that it would be really cool for us to act like other countries and that we had uniform, um, laws and regulations around the entire country. And that ended up with us getting all sorts of really good things, but it also, when, mm -hmm. you know, and one of those included that you knew what to expect. And that has been breaking down over the last, you know, approximately 30 years or so. Um, and that came w along with an increase in federal power, starting with World War I, really with World War II, and continuing along with the Cold War. Um, and the consensus that it ought to be the same everywhere has broken down. I think that it really first broke down when we started getting cannabis legalization a decade or so ago. Because that became the first time when something could be totally legal in one state and and a felony in others. And even now where we have um, some form of legalization of cannabis in over half the country, 
it's still federally illegal, which means well, that, it's also just a step you know, away from the government deciding to start raiding places the, again. Well, that depends on you know. This gets right. to the so what is federal power over state power is one of those questions, and it has certainly come to a head with the Dobbs decision on abortion, on health care, on what people can do. And the, the assault that is happening is, in fact, the assault on the basic human right of self-determination. It is that you ought to be able to do with your own body all sorts of things that that other people may not approve of and the list of things that you shouldn't be able to do ought to be like really 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 short uh and that is under assault right now and that is one of the things that 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 the Dobbs decision gets to is that Alito basically said that you don't have the right to your own body it wasn't merely that they threw it back to the states it's that they said the states can regulate things about your body that that they couldn't before. Okay, I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> and that's, uh, I don't disagree with you. Uh, I think that the core of that analysis, um, uh, well, how can I put this? I think it's simplified, but I don't disagree with you. Um, it, it actually... If, if it weren't if it yeah, weren't simplified, easily. we'd no, be no here doubt. for six hours. <laughs> we, we we could you know we, yeah, we could well, spend, we could the first thing that popped in my head, I mean, is an, another recent creeping authoritarianism about whether you know of self determination was the vaccine for COVID. Right, you had a lot of now. Certainly, okay. the government didn't force you in most places to get the vaccine, but it did for a, a time. Uh, for example illustrate that you were not allowed to work if you did not have the vaccine. You know, those types of things. Yeah. Well, that that that's that's an overstatement, but 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 you know. Yes. Governments have emergency powers. And and there are lists of things that we generally assume to be genuine emergencies mm -hmm. that include things like natural disasters, fires, wars, and pandemics. And, and if you even want to go onto a historical aspect of it, um, the treatment of smallpox occurred reliably with with shutterings around the time that we became an independent country. And one of the reasons that we won the revolution was because yeah. we vaccinated oh. people and the British didn't. I and did our soldiers that. were fit and theirs were. That's, an, that's a fun fact. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. So, so, um, but this this gets back to what goes on, you know, what goes on in normal times and what goes on when there's an emergency. And we've had this problem with unending emergencies. Mm -hmm. This was this was the whole 9-11 problem where where the problem with our response to terrorist attacks was to create an unending war. And wars are emergencies. You cannot have an unending emergency. It becomes normal. You know, you know, an emergency is definitionally a thing that is not normal. And part of our difficulty of dealing with the pandemic has been how much do we treat it as an emergency and how do we change, how much do we treat it as a normal thing? And when it comes to the vaccines, there, you know, there are things like it used to be absolutely required yep. that if you went to school, yep. you had to have your little vaccination card and you got all of your things. Um, um, my partner who first went to Europe in high school in the late 70s or so 
uh, had to mm-hmm. actually get a vaccination card to go to, like, France. In the 80s, when the first time that I went to Europe, you had to attest that you'd had all of your vaccinations, right. but they didn't make you prove it. You, know, you, didn't have, you didn't have to get a note from your doctor. Um, and we dropped all of those things because it became uniform and expected that you didn't have to ask somebody, have you been, have you been vaccinated mm-hmm. for smallpox? Because everybody had been. You didn't have to ask, did you get a polio vaccine? Because everybody did. That COVID pushed things back 70 years. It's like my parents um, remember that, that when the polio vaccines came out, that people gleefully lined up for hours in in centers where the lines were managed, et cetera, by the National Guard and so on to get a polio vaccine. It, it was common that, that people didn't go swimming in the summer because that was polio season. You know, you have flu season in the winter. Well, you had polio season in the that, summer. And we beat that. Obviously, I wasn't around back then. Um, but wouldn't the problem, I mean, one of the problems, the issue, that, that's a much better, let, let's, let's it's just not say a, it's issue. issue. One of the issues, issues around, nice- say, COVID, um, and I'm, I recognize that it, you know, it was a pandemic, is that it didn't seem maybe via either the communication or the trust or the people around you that it was nearly as deadly as it was being communicated to be. And now, um, now I have gotten COVID. I have been vaccinated and gotten COVID. Um, and I'll tell you the antivirals are lovely. <laughs> right? I mean, it's just like, I mean, I, I had, you know, a couple of weeks of, of, tough breathing and, uh, you know, fatigue, but the actual, you know, I want my mommy, I'm going to die. That was over in 24 hours because of the antivirals. Um, it, comparatively, I, I think that was probably the challenge is that how communicating in a way that people, I mean, why aren't the issue being trust? How, why aren't we trusting this information that this was so dangerous um, it, it's, get up. Okay. Okay. One, this was the very first time that humanity has ever faced a new major disease and that we had the knowledge and technology to understand what was going yeah, I on. I would agree. Yeah. The, the second part time. of that is the most important. Yes. And, and, and one of the things, and this is why they call it a novel pandemic or a novel disease, is because it was totally new. We didn't know, and we still don't know. That's one of the things, I mean, it's really scary to know that, but we're among the first humans on this planet who have been able, who have, who have, who are in a situation where we don't know is unusual and scary. So, so, you know, remember that one of the issues that happened was that the Trump administration dismantled the pandemic preparedness organization two years before the pandemic, that they basically, they basically took the water sprinklers out of the building and said, we haven't had a fire in 75 years. Why are we still paying for them? And, you know, (laughs) and the gods punish hubris. So, um, um, and so we were not prepared. We, we were, we were also faced with a disease that we did not understand and an awful lot of the original things that were being said about it was people saying either the truth that we don't know what's going on and then people going, how can you not know what's going on? And, and making the best guess at the time. Um, and 
then the administration tried to sweep it under the rug. Oh, it's just the flu. Oh, it's this. It'll go away. And, and that politicized and weaponized the discussion of it. We also didn't have the sorts of things that happened all the time in our era and our parents' era where there were no like PSAs. There were no, you know, there were no PSAs for, 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 um, COVID. I mean, you know, there used to be PSAs about seatbelts. You know, there were PSAs about get your polio vaccine. There were PSAs about, we didn't have any of that. The government didn't do that. The funds weren't there. We were not prepared and we did not act. And, and that created, among other things, an information vacuum where, where other stuff came in and it, it's part of why we are here, is that a combination of, of we got a bit of bad luck, we were not prepared for it, we shot ourselves in the foot at the same time. And that's been a really big issue with this because damn straight, this is hard. If, if we had done the sorts of things that were being discussed early in, in this, that the Safra Center, which is a ethics and technology and medical center out of Harvard, came up with a really good paper about how to fight it. And they had what to do, and there's an outline there of what could have been an effective response. Now, in 2022, it probably wouldn't have worked. I mean, you know, when when I was working on some of this stuff, because when it started, I was at ACLU, and I moved to EFF in the midst of the pandemic. And when, and part of what we were concerned about was things that we were talking about right now. How do you establish an emergency protocol that you can take down? And both ACLU and EFF have been dealing with this where we did not want pandemic protocols that would not come down because we didn't want we didn't want to end up in the situation where, you know, we still take our shoes off at airports because one guy failed to blow up a plane. And I don't want I don't want to demean the situation, but I want to you to have that to illustrate that we are not only just fighting the last war on that, we are fighting something that nobody remembers how it even started. And at at ACLU, we were we, we, we were we were discussing things like when do we have to when do we have to support the people who are fighting the government? When do we have to support the government for emergency measures? And we had long discussions around the table about what, what, about what we would do with this. But in, in any event, when the data came out of Iceland that a large number of people, the fear at the time was like 80%, but like 30% of people were asymptomatic, then all of the protocols that people had in place to fight TB, to fight HIV, to fight all of these other things where we'd done it before, it was all off the table because one third of the people who right. have it and are, are contagious don't even know it. And, th- and that has led to things like Lots of countries that that had that had real enforced lockdown and could do it on a nationwide basis, like Japan, New Zealand, Australia, even what they were doing in China, where they did massive draconian lockdowns of entire cities, that stopped working as time went on, and the, you know, lots of stuff happened in the early parts of this year in China where they where it 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 that strategy fell apart because you couldn't do something simple like take someone's temperature and know they were sick and and that meant that the pandemic protocols were destined to break down um 
I'm also going to mention that at, when this started, they, lots of people who were panicking uh, pointed out that we never had a vaccine produced in less than five years before. And we had one come out in like nine or 10 months. And it was pretty darn good. Um, we've been having a rough time of it right now for lots of reasons. I'm feeling pretty good about what the fall boosters that are going to be Omicron boosters are doing, that, that it really hurts to be in a situation that we're in like this. But from a humanity standpoint, we are going to beat this disease in a decade which humanity has never done before. But a decade is a long time for a person, and it really sucks to be in the middle of it. And both of these things are true at the same time. It really sucks to be in the middle of it right now. I, you know, particularly if you're a kid or a teenager or in your 20s where you want to be going off and doing things, that it just really sucks to have that time of your life consumed by this stupid ass pandemic. I, 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 I understand what the problems are, but we are going to beat it and we're going to beat it in ways that we don't. And this, there's a thing about the whole thing where it looks like COVID, mm -hmm. the original estimates were that it was going to be 1% fatal. And that's more or less okay. Particularly if we have a recognition that if something kills you in a year right. rather than in a week, it's just, it was still a fatal disease. And 1% and as a person, pandemic comes, 99% chance you're going, you're, you're going to, you're, you're going to survive See, and make your safe. That's a great reference. Roll. You're probably going to live. <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, people. <laughs> Okay, so we'll, we'll yeah. Go ahead. However, however, one percent fatality means three point three million dead people in in America. Do you really want three point three million so, people in your country ooh, to die? Boy, for you to say it not? that way. Of course, we don't want three point three million people to die. Um, but as a counterpoint, and remember, I am vaccinated. I understand the dangers. How many of those people that died mm -hmm. had something else wrong with them, right? It was through complications thereof. It wasn't... Uh, it matters because there's a certain level of self-accountability that, that you need to take. Why does the that fact matter? that if you are obese, that it, it, there's a 99% chance that you are obese because of you. Right? It may not be 99, but... But there's quite a bit, right? Yeah. You, you, you can reduce your caloric yeah. intake. You can exercise. You can, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't um, accept this. I don't accept what was that? this. No, go ahead. I don't accept this. I mean, I, I'm, on, I'm on the opposite end of this because when I was young, I was really, really, really skinny. And, you know, and like, and like most people... Um, I've gotten sure. to middle age and put on 50 pounds from when I was in college and, 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 you know, <laughs> you're going to look at me and say, you were once 50 pounds lighter. It's like, yeah, I, you know, you know, really you could count my ribs and all. It wasn't my fault that I was skinny. It was just the way that I was. And there are many, many, many people who have all of these things and, and playing this who gets dumped over on the lifeboat game is a power. Oh, if we had more time. Um, <laughs> I, I don't disagree. I, I think that we should value every life and try and uh, I'll leave it at that because we don't have time to go into the f philosophy of that. And, and I would love to, though, at some point. Um, before I let you go, uh, I do want to thank you for your time and I would like to have you on again and some of your cohorts on again, but I, yeah, I, I think it would be wonderful, but I do, I want to give you an Let's opportunity. Let's do that. If there, if, if by some magical okay. wand wave, there are a million people that listen to this episode, what is it that you want them to hear 
about EFF or you or privacy or government or whatever it is? What is it you wish they would hear and truly consider? EFF.org, please donate. We need you. We need your support. Our, our goal is that your rights and freedoms should not change because you are on the internet, because you are talking over something that that technology is the center of the world right now and consequently we need to have people who understand mm -hmm. it and we, yes. this is a larger thing that we can talk about later public interest technology but but come to EFF see what we do we have lots of information we have guides and so on and and please become a member I agree with you 100% and with that this has been more than a refresh a podcast about data and the people who wrangle it this podcast is hosted by JD, Command Prompt Founder and Postgres Conference Chair, and is produced by me, Lindsay Hooper, Director of Events at Command Prompt, Inc. Command Prompt provides Postgres support, professional services, custom development, and community leadership. Since 1997, we've focused on providing just excellent service, custom tailored to your organization's needs. We'll see you soon, wherever you get your podcasts.